Hello, I'm Richard Klein, Exhibitions Director at the Aldrich Contemporary Art Museum. Today's discussion on erasure is occasioned by the Exhibition 2020, which is on view at the Aldrich until March 14th. We are joined today by two artists in the exhibition, Marty Corman and Diana Spungen, who both came independently to the subject of erasure. Besides Marta, Marty and Diana, the other artists who have participated in the exhibition include Oasis DeVerney, Judith Essler, Andy Mister, William Powhida, and Gil Scullion. 2020 was conceived in early 2019 to acknowledge what was promising to be a critical year in American political history. The exhibition was planned to coincide not only with the presidential election, but also with the centennial of the 19th Amendment to the US Constitution, giving women the right to vote, a major milestone in the struggle for equal rights. The year 2020, and now early 2021, has proven to be more tumultuous than anyone could have imagined. Besides a landmark election, the United States has been dealing with a global health crisis as it, and its associated economic fallout, a national reckoning with systematic racial injustice, and a violent denial of the democratic process. Seven artists whose practices include drawing based on photographic imagery were invited to respond to 2020 by creating works on paper that reflect their concerns for this pivotal year. Born in Barcelona in 1970, Marty Corman lives and works in Brooklyn. Selected exhibitions include Un Elefant en el Prado, Espacio Minimo, Madrid, Spain, 2019. Formalizing their concept, After Levine, After Evans, Jose Benview Gallery, New York, 2018. Walk the Distance and Slow Down, selections from the collection of Joanne Gonzalez Hickey at the Boulder Museum of Contemporary Art, Boulder, Colorado, in 2017. Postcards to AZ, Jose Benview Gallery, New York, 2016. Marty Corman, Galleria Canyon, Madrid, 2014. Formalizing their concept, Galleria Casado, Sant Pau, Madrid, 2014. Formalizing their concept, Jose Benview Gallery, New York, 2013. And false documents and other illustrations, the Portland Museum of Art, Portland, Maine, in 2010. Corman's work is represented in public collections, including the Museum of Modern Art, New York, Museo Renia Sofia, Madrid, and the Dallas Museum of Art. Corman is represented by Jose Benview Gallery, New York, and Espacio Minimo in Madrid. Diana Spungen was born in Latvia's seaside capital of Riga under Soviet rule, and she immigrated with her family to the United States and settled in New York City. The artist's work has been exhibited extensively in solo and group exhibitions in national and international venues, including the Bronx Museum of Art, New York, Sculpture Center, New York, the Bass Museum of Art, Miami, Florida, Tomio Koyama Gallery, Tokyo, Japan, Invisible Exports, New York, New York, the Brooklyn Museum of Art, New York, and the Museum of Contemporary Art, Tucson, Arizona. She is a recipient of the 2019-2020 Pollock Krasner Foundation Grant, a 2017 New York Foundation for the Arts Fellowship in Sculpture, and a 2015 and 2020 e-grant from the Foundation for Contemporary Arts. She's been an artist in residence at the McDowell Colony, Lower Manhattan Cultural Council, CEC Arts Link, Dewey Dene, and Art Omai. Oh Spongen is currently an assistant professor at Parsons, the new school for design in New York City. She lives and works in Williamsburg, Brooklyn. Independently of each other, uh, Marty and Diana came to the subject of erasure um, for the second iteration of the show, which I thought was really quite interesting. And um, I think their backgrounds, the fact that uh, both of them were born outside the United States, I think played into this, but also the media. Uh, certainly if you work on paper and particularly uh, Diana works exclusive, almost exclusively with graphite on paper and Marty um, works with, uh, draws with pencil, but also paints. But if you work on paper, uh, obviously erasure is a huge part of that, of the practice in most cases where there's always uh, the, promise of being able to erase or at least the temptation to erase. And um, both, both Marty and Diana, uh, like I said, made works for the second iteration of the show, which involved erasure. And uh, we'll talk a little bit about them. Uh, uh, and first, uh, we want to maybe just talk to uh, each of them about how they came to the decision to make a work dealing with erasure. And we'll start with uh, Marty. Hi, Richard. Um, my, um... I think the, the decision is never um, immediate, so it comes through 
a, a digesting, a long-term digesting uh, thing until you came with the idea of um, uh, putting this show. And I think in Spain, for example, I do think that it's a country that through his colonizations, it's been erased in so many cultures. That will be like the first um, layer of uh, this uh, idea. The second layer will be a very long um, regime, like the dictatorship regime, uh, Franco, who basically imposed one language, um, one religion, one ideology, um, and then will erase anything that will step aside from uh, from different angles, no? And then my parents, for example, who they've been activists all their lives related to that subject, recuperating what was being erased in, in this particular case in, in Catalonia, no? And then, um, for example, one example, when I was in high school, I do have a book talking about languages and Catalan, Basque, Galician, all these languages, they, they were, uh, portray as dialects. So my parents went to the school, um, um, you know, to the, the, have a meeting with them and, and they all uh, finally accept that they have to change that book. So they took the book out and they put a new book with new, you know, uh, the, the, the new thinking. And little by little, many people that generation, they start writing what was, or rewriting what was uh, being a race for, imagine, 36 years of dictatorship. Um, and I think that's on another layer. And then the third layer, I think it's like an auto a race. For example, in Barcelona, and it has to do with tourism. Barcelona has been very successful since, since 1992 in a global um, you know, marketing way, which is good and bad, I think. The bad part is that tourism affects tremendously the way how um, the culture of a place is portrayed. For example, um, uh, like a little village that has a celebration, uh, an internal celebration, even uh, sometimes medieval celebrations, now they've been watching, watched by tourists. So those celebrations are portrayed in relationship with the tourists. So it became a little Walt Disney-like, um, and they start losing uh, maybe its own um, authenticity and is changing, transforming the, the culture of the place. And I think that's been happening in many other places in the world. No? So, and I think it's uh, the latest uh, race of the culture, it's tourism um, and, and in some places it's still colonizations no? in a strong way. So your your work amendments uh, it's a um, it's a handful of sculptures uh, in which a, a pencil slowly morphs into its opposite an eraser, and what you were just discussing it uh, the, actually is implied by this work of actually the writing of history or the writing of something and then its gradual transformation and disappearance through time, and um, it's fascinating that you chose a sculptural medium to do this. Um, when you're, you don't make a lot of sculpture. Yeah, and I think uh, it's a good question. I don't know how to answer it immediately, but I do think that probably the is a sculpture that uh, it, it touch reality. It's like it, 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 it's like the presence of those objects, even though I manipulate them, they look like you are they're, they're there. No, so I, I think maybe that's something about that that uh, to bring to the viewer a more close experience, probably, I don't know exactly, no? but uh, that could be. Well, it, it, it also, uh, it, this is a great segue into, into Diana's work, is that the sculptural installation, because the, the objects are one-on-one -on -one scale, they imply the human hand. Obviously, the pencil and the eraser are made to fit in the hand, and it implies agency, the idea of the hand being the agency to change things. and. Um, even you know, with the recent uh, election, with the presidential election last year, we all did drawings. We all, um, most of us, uh, made a mark on a piece of paper that was then fed into a voting machine. And this idea, the hand is actually the agency. It's uh, we, we like to think of uh, our minds being the agency for political change, but um, you know, the protests, the Black Lives Matter protests last year, um, you know, 
people marching were holding signs with their hands. The, the hand was part of the protest also. And, uh, um, and Diana, obviously, uh, her work, um, uh, Erase 45, deals with a hand, but uh, the hand of our, uh, our past president. So this idea of erasure, before I talk about that work in particular, um, I think it lends itself to the idea of a mistake. So with art making or writing, the idea of erasing something means admitting to an, a mistake. Um, I also think as an artist, when you make artwork about erasure, as many um, artists have, that you're you're kind of somehow showing some vulnerability. You're admitting the mistake. You're making the mistake evident or elevating the mistake. In my own work, before Erase 45, I kind of had a unwritten philosophy that I would, wouldn't erase, that I would uh, be honest about my mark, even if I didn't like it. <laughs> so whatever mark was made in a drawing, I would keep it. Um, the only time I'd erase if it was for some technical reason that it wouldn't work in an animation. But other than that, every mark I make is just kind of an intuitive mark. I'm not thinking about how good the drawing is. Um, so I think erasing is, is about mistakes and vulnerability um, in terms of art making. In terms of politics, I was, um, you know, I'm an immigrant to this country. I was raised by a, a Holocaust survivor, father, and I was constantly being told about history and all the horrors of uh, World War II. And obviously, um, perhaps one of the most um, prevalent examples of revisionist history are Holocaust deniers. So that idea of uh, erasing what is inconvenient to your um, political goals. Um, when I made the work Erase 45, I would never have thought that I would make that work um, if you told me some time ago. I also have a hard time pronouncing the former president's name, <laughs> so I try not to say it out loud because it makes me feel a little bit um, ill. So 45 seems a little bit more, um, you know, tolerable. So when I made that work, it was kind of by accident. I somehow came across some Donald Trump. Oh, well, I said it. <laughs> I came across a drawing of his, of something else. I think it was a skyscraper. And it got me interested to see if I could find more. So I started doing a little Googling and I found this auction of this drawing of a hand. Um, and I just thought it was, awful and perfect simultaneously because it's such a bad drawing it's so cartoonish it's so childlike it's worse than most children's you know turkey hand drawings that they do uh it's it's as if he didn't even try he did it very quickly but then his signature really takes up the whole drawing and so it was about um it was just layered it, it was a very very simple drawing but also very layered so I thought, well, what would it be like um, to redraw that, to recreate it, but then erase it? So I, I just had it as a kind of conceptual idea, but when I actually did the drawing, I felt kind of ill because a mark is a very personal thing. So when you're mimicking someone else's hand, maybe it's a stretch, but you're kind of living vicariously through them in this one particular way. So when I was retracing that, especially of his hand, the mark of his hand, I felt really ill and I couldn't wait to get the drawing over with. Um, and I had to focus very closely to make sure I got it to mimic his original. But it was a very um, taxing act, as simple as the drawing is. Uh, but then when I raced it, it felt very cathartic. It was like, oh, yes, let's get rid of this. Let's get rid of this right away, as if it didn't exist. But of course, you can't erase something uh, really permanently, any drawing. There's always a little bit of a mark or, uh, you know, an imprint into the, the paper. The other aspect, I think, of erasure, um, which um, 
was brought forward you know, by the election was the erasure of votes, the attempted erasure of votes. So there's something else in here other than just erasing the Trump years and erasing the past. It's more uh, denying the present through erasure. So I don't know if you want to, or Marty, if you want to talk a little bit about that aspect of uh, the idea of uh, the erasure of votes, literally, which is the erasure of democracy. Well, I think democracy is always uh, fragile and to be watched. And I think uh, Trump is one of the, like talking, well, a little like uh, we were saying, he, he didn't, he print in ink. So ink can be not erased, uh, erase, you know? Somehow, like I had the, the feeling that um, the mark of ink that Trump put on a paper, we could crumple and put it in a garbage, but I think we should um, keep it and learn from, from that, no? Because uh, it will be a mistake to try to turn the page or, or just get the page, uh, you know, uh, out and on the garbage. So I think it's, uh, he just, it's giving us an another, uh, example of what can happen any moment because the well it's the idea of house of cards no the fragility of a structure that can felt even at, i do and i don't know who says that but i like this idea of um even when looks like there is peace and that democracy is working even at that moment there's always some um uh, some ideology among other ideologies always so even when everything looks like it's working we should be um, uh, in conflict in the sense that we have to still fight for that democracy and what you're saying is the the, the famous uh, saying uh, that the price of freedom is eternal vigilance yeah that's 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 exactly yeah. that you see and, much you know the other thing is is uh, whether we don't really want to totally erase things, the, the past. And I think this debate has come up uh, through the toppling of monuments in the United States this year with the Black Lives uh, Matter movement. And uh, you know, we have an image of the toppling of the statue of Jefferson Davis in Richmond, uh, Virginia on June 10th, 2020. And we have some other images, um, uh, the toppling of uh, Saddam Hussein statue in uh, Baghdad on April 9th, two, uh, 2003. And um, uh, we also have a defaced Franco uh, sculpture in, in, was that was in Madrid? Do you know where that image came from, Marty? It was in Barcelona. There's been discussions in the United States about taking these, uh, particularly sculptures of the Confederacy and, and recontextualizing and put them, putting them in, in together. Yeah. And, you know, there was an attempt made in uh, Tallinn in Estonia, uh, the, the sculpt, what's called the statue graveyard, which we have some images where, uh, you know, Soviet era uh, sculptures that were torn down were brought together and just thrown essentially in this uh, this, this uh, empty lot, um, mm -hmm. not formally, but kind of as a, you know, people would come and tourists would come and look at them. Um, the, the interesting thing is, I mean, we're talking about public monuments and at the same time, we're talking about your, your both of your work in this, this exhibition. There's a real difference here. The public monument is something, these are, you know, things made out of bronze that are put up by, public consensus or the consensus of the government. And then on the other hand, the two of you as art, individual artists have your voice, your democratic voice. And the voice of a drawing obviously is a very soft voice compared to a monumental bronze sculpture. But uh, you know, equally, probably equally as valid. And I think in the context of a democracy that I think is really one of the reasons to do this exhibition 2020 is to give the voice of the artist as a vote in a sense, uh, the public uh, vote and putting it in a museum where it's a public space, uh, the way a, a bronze monument would be put in a public square. Um, I think that, well, a drawing compared to a monument is very different. A monument, you're supposed to look up in awe and admire, wonder what the history was to put this person on this pedestal, literally. Um, <laughs> But a drawing is very intimate, not just the making of it, but even somebody looking at it. You're imagining the mark making. It's, I mean, the scale could vary, of course, but you're, you're, I think it's the most vulnerable of art making forms because you can't lie about the mark. 
Um, but it's interesting because both what both you and Marty did, there is a, a sense of, there is a, a, an element of commemoration in there, like talking about this, this time, or in the case, Diane, of your drawing of a person. Um, but you know, as you say, in an intimate way. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think when thinking about this show in general, I wanted to, I just wanted to have a quieter moment. <laughs> there is just so much sensationalism surrounding the last four years and the comedy of it all, the tragedy of it all. I just wanted a more kind of quiet, contemplative moment. Um, and that's exercise my power, but also with the last piece that I just uh, contributed, where you can take the uh, heat sensitive pencils, I wanted to translate that to the viewer also. They have the power. It's interesting, Marty and I have this kinship of parallels in different ways, but there is a, a at least I think there's a kinship, I don't know about Marty, <laughs> between our work. Um, but I think with the heat sensitive pencils, this idea that you can erase or you can make a mark. And with uh, Marty's work, uh, Amendments, this idea that you can, yes, the pencil's turning into an eraser, but you can choose if you want to erase or create. Um, so there's there's power in that. And, and Diane, the, the, time, the time factor, I think it's important on us, like somehow you are, you you work the time in your favor, like you 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 start from frames to create this movement, and finally you know like a, 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 the message through that movement. And I do the opposite. I dissect yeah. uh, in frames, and I I show the frames. You no, know, like we are on the same path of uh, showing the feeling of um, present or time yeah. uh, in in a way that slows down. The look of the piece, like like wh while we are drawing uh, the drawing at that same moment, no, a little, and um, and I think we both have that in common somehow. Yeah, I think time very is. Different. Yeah, I think time is very prevalent in both our work, and um, it's prevalent. I mean, it's always prevalent. We can't mm -hmm. avoid, it, but um, I was more conscious of time these last few years. Yes ever. I couldn't for this year to be over. I was willing to just give up a year of my life to just have it be over already and time travel forward. Um, I've never felt that way before, you know, um, just things felt very slow, very fast. I still can't believe it's been a year of the pandemic. I just, the concept of time has completely been stretched. And, uh, yeah. And, and Diana, of course, there's your work is there's a performative aspect to your work, and certainly in Erased Forty Five, as you said, it's a, you drew it and you erased it, and it was you know a duration of time. With Marty's uh, amendments, yes, there's a sense of time, but the amount of time embedded in making that work was considerable. In fact, Marty, you're kind of like the magician that there's the finished objects. And you know, I don't know how much time you actually made spent crafting those objects, but there's certainly an incredible amount of deliberation. And it wasn't a one take thing. Where I know you worked on that for weeks. And I think in the in the case of um, Marty and uh, Diana, your work, there's a there's a deeper connection. It's not just a formal a superficial formal connection between these works, but a little bit deeper. And I think, like I said before, the fact that you both came at this, unlike the other artists in the show, of being born outside the United States, I think is significant. Um, uh, I, I think the you know, United States has never had to really face up to the fact that, that we don't acknowledge a lot of our past. Uh, you know, we're really, we, we think of ourselves as, uh, you know, being so open, free thinking, but, you know, it's not true. Um, so, you know, the other thing we wanted to talk about is there is a, a history of artists making work referencing erasure, and we have, uh, you know, it goes from the formal to the very specific, and there, there's some works, um, and I have to thank Marty actually for pulling these together, there's some works that actually really deal with erasure in a very, very specific way. I think, um, you know, one of, uh, one of the most, sig most significant 
bigger ones there, the Gorilla, uh, Gorilla Girls piece from 1999, a race discrimination, which was literally a, a pink pearl eraser uh, printed with um, the, the Gorilla Girls logo, the Gorilla Mask and a race discrimination written on it, which was a, a, an open-ended edition. Um, I think you also have, um, you know, fam the famous uh, um, Robert Rauschenberg uh, erased the Kooning drawing from 1953, which was, you know, a really transgressive act of, in, in some ways, this is an act like toppling a monument where you have you have uh, de Kooning, you know, um, at the top of his game as an American abstract expressionist, and you have a younger generation of artists erase, literally erasing uh, the drawing, um, kind of implying, uh, you know, passing the torch to the next generation and one generation of artists, um, you know, moving beyond the, the previous generation. Um, the, um, What's relevant here, uh, Richard, is that the when Rashber erased the cooling, this was still like Diana was saying before. There was still a little of the drawing left. So the new generations erased the other generation, but never completely. So there's always the layers of what's left from the other generation that is still in the next generations. You know? And I think that's uh, something that happened there. You know, you know, correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe that actually Rauschenberg asked de Kooning about this, actually talked to him. Like de Kooning was aware that he was doing this, which I thought was very interesting. And of course, de Kooning, I, I think, didn't object to it all, at all, which, I, you know, I, I think, you know. Um, as far as I know, de Kooning chose the drawing that he would. Right. Uh, okay. Isn't it that Jasper Jones wrote the sentence Yes. Um, if no, yes. Diana or yes. Richard. I yes. also thought that work is, you know, it's longing too. It's wishful thinking. Like I'm better than you. I have power over you. But also that act. Um, I obviously thought about that work a lot when I made a race forty five. Um, I think that act elevated de Kooning in a way because he created it as an artwork. It hangs in the Whitney, and there it is, right? So. Um, it's more about de Kooning than I think it is about Rauschenberg. Um, so I don't know what that says about my work, Erase 45, but <laughs> I guess I can't, er uh, I, he can't be erased. You know. And of course, you know, another example would be uh, Claus Oldenburg and Akuja von Bruggen's uh, typewriter eraser, the large, uh, which um, is outside the uh, National Archive building. And Marty, did you see this when you were at the archive building? Did you actually? I, I, I completely miss it because mm -hmm. at that point I was not yet uh, thinking about the erasing, no? And I definitely will, I will, I, saw, I have seen it in pictures, but I, I completely miss it. And that, that was right in front. I know that was in front. So, you know, obviously the National Archive is not about erasure. It's about, you know, saving things, uh, valuable things that are valuable to the nation. And, uh, Slyly, uh, Oldenburg and von Bruggen put a giant eraser outside this building, uh, which uh, the, the, you know, was paid for by the, the federal government, I believe, the sculpture, which I think is wonderfully ironic, actually, to put an object like that outside a building that, well, to save things. Archiving, archiving is inherently choosing. So you're choosing what to archive, so you're erasing everything else, right? What are all yeah. those things projected? Um, so that's, I think it's the end. That's a very good point. When you choose, you are erasing something else always, and I think that's a very important point here. The idea of what looks like this is our building with our history means this is our, our choice of the history that we 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 want. Then these other histories that are not there, you know, and that's that's great. That's a good point. And, you know, the final example would be Anne Hamilton's Indigo Blue from 1991, um, where um, uh, she took uh, an eraser wet, uh, that she wet with her own saliva and erased the text in the military manual and collected all of the, sha the, the shavings, the, the erased bits in a pile next to the actual manual, which was obviously a work of labor, incredible labor and dedication, but also the subject matter, the idea of you know, 
her saliva erasing this uh, this ma this book that was part of the military industrial complex. And I, I think that kind of, in, in some ways, it reflects a little bit on the work that both of you did for, have done for this show of, um, you know, the, the kind of personal uh, dealing with the with the outside world, with the political, the intersection of those things. Well, those things are always intertwined. People, you know, I've noticed, especially this last year, talking to my students, and they talk about their parents' philosophies with politics, and they were like, oh, I don't deal with politics. I don't do politics. I'm not political. Um, and I wish this country was more educated that everything is political. Every choice you make is political. Your personal life is political. Um, so those two things are completely intertwined. And we've all gone through this together. And I, I guess when I made the work, I was hoping for a little bit of interchange, interconnectedness with the audience even though you know you you can't be there standing by it but to have some kind of um, commonality and experience or thought um, and politics always seems so kind of cold and boring to a lot of people um, but if you personalize it and really think about what it is it it's not boring at all it's terrifying usually <laughs> well you know can we can we really the last four years, uh, and can we really erase the last four years? And do uh, we don't want to really? I, I think we want to remember what happened in the last four years. And both of your work becomes, if I could use a word we just were were, were throwing around, archive. Your both of your work is the part of the archive of this period, uh, and hopefully it will remain uh, in the future and inform people in the future. It's not going away when the show ends. It'll exist. These exist as independent works of art which were made in a specific period and great works of art always talk about when they were made they a work of art is uh, inexorably connected to when it was made and here and diane in your in your case when you were um because you couldn't erase the actual drawing that trump did it's interesting the act of a that uh, that Diana Diana was doing, no, um, and I think that um, it's something that reinforced this this uh, this. Well, I'm, I'm lost here. Sorry. <laughs> let, 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 let it sit there. I, I know what you're you're getting at, though. It's like it's like you know Diana doing a distasteful thing in order to remember. It's like sometimes yeah, exactly. we have to we have to go to the we have to go to the gym in order to get better, in better shape. And maybe in this case, Diana had, this was like an exorcism in a sense. It, an exorcism, exactly. You see, <laughs> yeah, that's, that's it. That's it. The, funny thing, the funny thing about that drawing, I would have bought it if I could have afforded it, but I think it was like $15,000 or, or something ridiculous. I mean, if it was- You don't like, need to, you don't need to. It was $100 on eBay, I would have bought it, destroyed it, but. Um, but I think it was better. It was more interesting to go through the process. And also the original was likely done in Sharpie, not pencil. Um, yeah. that's not your medium. Limit of choice. <laughs> right. and, yeah, and, and going back to the other thing, like finally we, we cannot erase ink. So what it's been printed this last year with the virus we know, the uh, corona virus, and the virus uh, that represent um, Trump. It's so uh, strongly printed in a paper that it's better to uh, let that paper be there and work with that and make sure that, uh, you know, we have uh, more tools to, to probably, um, like education, I don't know, uh, more affordable education, things like could uh, elevate a little um, all of us to to have different choices um, you know there are there are some particularly in the scientific community who believe that everything that's ever happened in the universe can is not erased that it still is recorded in some form and i i aware of this you know they were uh, finding these clay vessels from the ancient middle east how uh, they were turned on a, on a pottery wheel and they think somehow that the sounds in the pottery studio could be recorded, like the artist's hands holding the wet clay 
somehow sound was transmitted into the clay and somehow there's a way to get the sounds out of that vessel. And I, I you know, I, I do believe that there's resonance for everything kind of in the universe. And so maybe nothing can be erased, that it's all there to be retrieved somehow. Um, yeah. And, you know, maybe uh, someday we'll remember everything. From the very beginning, the idea with this exhibition was uh, it would be a group of artists who work on paper and uh, primarily work with photographic imagery as uh, a foil to uh, the media, which uh, obviously has taken center stage during this period. And um, the idea that the media and, and not just mainstream media, but social media is so much about uh, the moment and not so much about responsibility in many cases. And a hand-drawn work by an artist, a work on paper, implies responsibility, implies uh, agency, implies um, the, the identity of the, of the person doing it in a very strong way. And you know, it could be argued that works on paper are perhaps uh, the most intimate of drawing media in the sense that are a seismograph of the artist's body and the artist's hand. We also produce uh, uh, in juxtaposition with the, new, with the exhibition, a newspaper in two editions. Uh, you can see the images scrolling on the screen now. It documents works in the show. Uh, the first edition um, is primarily images. The second edition has text provided by each artist. Um, they were open to provide any text they want to uh, accompany the images. And uh, each uh, paper is uh, 24 pages in length and uh, available both online uh, at the museum's website or actually at the museum in our uh, museum shop. Thank you all for joining us uh, today. Um, I want to thank Marty and Diana and Namulin by Cyan here at the Aldrich who uh, helped put this uh, panel discussion together. Um, I invite everyone uh, to come to the museum uh, to see the show. It's uh, on view up until March 14th, 2021.